Some people look at the past few years of my career, which thankfully have gone well, and assume that I've had my whole software engineering career figured out from the beginning. I can 100% tell you that is not the case, and I'm hoping that this video can give you some encouragement if you feel a little bit lost on your own engineering journey. My goal here is to show you my progression as a software engineer while I was a student. So from 2009 to 2014, I was a student at Stanford studying computer science, and I started out as someone who really didn't know too much about programming, and it took me years until I finally felt like I was a halfway competent programmer. During the five years I spent at Stanford, I had seven different programming jobs, four internships during the summer, and then three programming jobs I had during the academic year. Here's my journey from having never written a line of code to in my last year, getting five different full-time offers at FANG companies. My first internship was after my first year at Stanford at a small startup called Shopatumi. I'm gonna to be totally honest here and say that I was totally unqualified for this job. I had literally only done two programming classes at this point, and I don't think I had ever even opened up the terminal on my laptop. I stumbled into this internship simply due to the privilege I had of going to Stanford. In March or April every year, Stanford has a startup career fair where the smaller companies will come and try and recruit students. And so applying for the company was as simple as me going to the career fair and handing out my resume physically to the different recruiters. And so I probably handed out my resume to around 40 companies. The vast majority of them ghosted me, as expected. And I think I heard back from around five or six, and then the majority of them rejected me as well after like one conversation. The only reason I got the offer at Shopatumi is because frankly, I got lucky. And they happened to ask about a concept that we had just covered in that second programming class I was taking. The internship paid $20 an hour. And looking back, that's actually quite low for the Bay Area especially, because it hardly covered the studio apartment I was renting that summer, along with commute, food, and just general life expenses. But at the time, I was actually really happy because I remember the choice was either doing that internship or going back home to Michigan, which certainly would have paid less than $20 an hour. As you might expect, the actual internship was really difficult for me. Shop It To Me used Ruby as the programming language and Git for version control. I had never worked with Ruby and actually I had never worked with any scripting language and I literally had no idea what version control even meant. <laughs> the other factor in me doing poorly that summer was the actual product. Shop It To Me would go out and scrape different websites of fashion retailers and then email you if there was a price drop. Not only did I not care about shopping, I definitely didn't care about high-end fashion. And the majority of my wardrobe at this point was basically free t-shirts I had gotten from career fair. So I just had so little interest in the product of Shop It To Me. Given that I didn't care about the product that much and I didn't know enough about programming to really contribute, I don't think I learned that much on the job that summer but I did learn a lot about how to be a fully functioning adult. Growing up in Michigan and coming out to Stanford for college was a little bit scary, but it wasn't that bad because I was in the bubble of Stanford with a lot of infrastructure around me to make sure that I was doing okay. So that summer was where I left the Stanford bubble and I lived on my own in downtown San Francisco. I remember spending literally hours going on these free neighborhood walking tours that summer. And there was a website called funcheapsf.com, which worked out really well for me because I wanted things that were fun, cheap, and in San Francisco. In April or May of freshman year, a friend of mine told me that she was doing research with a political science professor that summer at Stanford. I'm pretty sure that they couldn't find anyone because they started the search so late. And so I basically ended up getting onto this three-person research team as the programmer. The idea was to analyze re-election rates for politicians who served on various committees. And this data lived across a bunch of different files containing comma-separated data. And so my job as a programmer was to look at correlations across all of these different spreadsheets. Looking back, I feel like this would have been a pretty straightforward task with a language like Python to be able to parse all this data. But of course, I didn't know that at the time. And thankfully, no one else on the team had enough knowledge of programming to call me out on my lack of knowledge. And so I ended up using Visual Basic and I created a, a graphical interface, a GUI, which is super rudimentary. And I look back at the code and I'm just embarrassed. And it would try and find some matches across different files. Updates for the project were due every Monday morning. And so there were a lot of Sunday nights where I would end up staying up until four or 5 a.m., basically an all-nighter, because I had to be able to show some meaningful progress or some new functionality that upcoming Monday. Given how little I knew about programming, it was pretty stressful to try and deliver something functional, but I was proud of whatever I got working by the end of the summer. And it was the first time in my life where I felt like the software I wrote could actually add value to other people. My commitment to the lab was 10 hours a week of work for the whole summer. I ended up getting around $1,400 for 100 hours of work the whole summer. So roughly 14 or $15 an hour. In my second year at Stanford, I had a better idea of what it meant to be a software engineer, but for the most part, I still had no idea what I was doing. I applied to around 50 companies and I got interviews at 20 of them. So that conversion rate was actually significantly higher compared to my first year, but I still ended up failing almost all the interviews I, 
I took on. I ended up taking a job at a company called Marin Software in San Francisco, which is a paid marketing firm. They basically helped companies manage ad campaigns on Google, Bing, Facebook. Marin Software is actually still around as a company today, but I think it's a really good counter example to the assumption that some people have, which is that you know everything in tech always goes up and to the right. So when I joined Marin Software, it was 2011, and it was a fairly hot company, and I actually ended up IPOing in 2013. But since the IPO, until now, the stock has lost 97% of its value. And so now the market cap today is around $50 million. It's really not much more than a penny stock. And so I just feel really bad for the people who worked there for years because their equity is pretty much wiped out. In terms of technology, I was pretty excited for the summer because at this point I had taken two classes in Java and the company also wrote most of their code in Java. But I had a pretty rude awakening when I got there for the summer internship because it turns out that doing a small class project in Java and actually contributing to a large Java code base with dozens of other engineers collaborating with you is a much different ballgame. The words serialization and deserialization were thrown around a lot that summer, which I had no idea what that meant. And I still didn't really know how to use version control because they used a different version control called subversion. It was pretty obvious to me at this point that I wasn't contributing as much as the other interns at the company. And so my strategy to remedy that was every night before bed for about half an hour, I would get a book about some programming language concept or some version control concept and I would read about it in bed for half an hour. It turns out that if you have not really used the language and built something with it, reading about a language concept or a version control concept is a really terrible idea. I retained nothing and I feel like I just wasted a bunch of time in the evenings that summer because I had no idea what the books were talking about. By the way, I previously talked about a really common way that engineers waste time like this. So if you're interested in that video, I'll leave a link for that in the description. The internship paid $25 an hour, which again, in retrospect, is not that much money for the Bay Area, but I was pretty happy because it was a significant bump from the $20 an hour I was making the previous summer. During my junior year at Stanford, I took on my fourth job, which was not writing code, but it was teaching other people how to write code. That was a section leading program at Stanford, and it was probably one of the best decisions I made throughout my whole Stanford career. The section leading program meant that undergrads would become teaching assistants for other undergrads as they were going through the first and second introductory programming classes. And this idea of peer-to-peer -peer learning is really powerful because students are able to learn much more effectively from someone who's one or two years removed from them rather than some expert who's been teaching the same content for 20 or 30 years. And as a teacher, this is really beneficial because the best way to learn something is to teach it. And so the section leading program really forced me to go back to the fundamentals and understand exactly why and communicate why I was debugging something in a certain way or why I was writing code in a certain way. Honestly, the section leading program was so nice that I probably would have done it for free because the community of other section leaders was so nice and amazing. And I learned a lot, but the nice thing was they actually paid you. So they paid around $15 an hour. My third summer internship was at a company called Walmart Labs. This was the first summer where I felt like I actually created something meaningful. I built an internal dashboard, which looked at the traffic and correlation of different search terms on walmart.com. I really enjoyed the project that summer because it touched a bunch of different parts of the technology stack. I had a cron job, which would periodically query some data warehouse. I would massage the data using some Ruby scripts, and then I would actually display it on the front end with a JavaScript charting library. When I presented my work at the end of the summer, a lot of the team really enjoyed my demo, but I'm also very confident that a couple of weeks after the internship ended, very few people or pretty much no one continued to use what I had built. One of the things I learned as a full-time engineer is that actively maintaining a code base or a project is really tough. And so unless there's a really compelling need to maintain something, a lot of these intern projects actually end up getting deleted. <laughs> So despite having three internships at this point, I felt like the main thing I was missing was the ability to really collaborate closely with a team of professional software engineers. The salary for Walmart Labs was $40 an hour and they gave a $1,500 a month housing stipend, which was way higher than my previous internships. And the way I thought about it was that $40 an hour translates to $80,000 a year, which would be enough for me to live off if I had graduated and taken that job. And so I finally felt like I had made it to be an employable, independent, engineer. My fourth internship was at Facebook, which was by far the best internship I had. I had been rejected from Facebook for each of the past three years. And so when I finally got that internship offer in my senior year, I was so happy to finally have a big name brand tech company on my resume. The internship was better in literally every single way. The first off, Facebook is already fairly large by 2013. And so there were hundreds of interns, not just from Stanford, but around the country who had come to Menlo Park. And the 
overall engineering team was also quite a bit younger than any of the other companies I had worked at. And so the overall environment was just way more social, way more collegial, and that actually led to the internship just being more fun. Second, the perks were almost unbelievable. It took me literally weeks to get over the fact that at any point, multiple times a day, I could go down to the micro kitchen and pick up a coconut water. Or I could go to Sweet Stop and get ice cream or cookies or fruit anytime I wanted. And they also had a gym on campus, not to mention breakfast, lunch, and dinner, which were all amazing. Facebook also provided amazing corporate housing along with shuttle service from my apartment in Mountain View to the Mellow Park campus. Facebook created an environment where you didn't have to worry about anything other than actually doing your work as a software engineer. And finally, of course, Facebook paid significantly more than any of the other jobs I had. They paid around $6,800 a month along with all these perks like the free housing, transportation, and then three meals a day and snacks. I worked on a team that summer called Nearby, which was in charge of showing you relevant places or restaurants when you opened up the Facebook app. And the technology I used was a uh, hack, like a derivative of PHP and JavaScript, along with Mercurial for the version control. And I actually wasn't familiar with any of this, but I finally felt like I was at a point in my career where I could learn things quickly. And that, in my mind, is a true test of a maturity of a software engineer. The other thing I loved about Facebook was a very clear and direct feedback structure. At the end of your internship on your last day, they would actually tell you if you got a return offer or not. And so getting that return full-time offer on my last day was probably one of the happiest moments of my whole Stanford journey. And I just felt like I had gone from uh, a freshman who really didn't know anything about coding to now being able to pick up all these new technologies and deliver production code. In my fifth and final year, I took on a job as a research assistant at a lab at Stanford. And there were two projects I worked on. One is I worked pretty closely with a postdoc to try and figure out the relationship between substitutes and complements in recommender systems. Um, and that was really cool because it actually turned out to be a publication. And the second project I worked on was actually implementing a recommendation system for this biomedical website where you'd recommend projects based on other projects people had used. At this point, I was feeling more and more confident as a developer every month. I was able to dive into this massive PHP code base and then also implement the front end to actually make the changes visible to the user. The RA job here was the perfect way to conclude my time at Stanford, not only because it covered my entire graduate tuition, but it also paid a stipend of around $25,500 for that whole academic year, which is, it doesn't sound like a lot, but for a 22 year old, that was a big deal because it meant that I was actually pocketing some money even after paying for room and board and expenses that happened as a student. And the other big benefit of this RA position is that it actually turned into a full-time job because the professor of that lab ended up starting a company and he recruited me. That story is uh, probably more fit for another video, but let me know if you're interested in that. As you can tell, I've had a bunch of experiences throughout my Stanford career. Some of them were great and some of them obviously not so great, but regardless of how I felt about the job at the moment, I really do feel like every experience helped me learn a lot and it helped me become a competent engineer by the time I graduated. The thing about being a software engineer is that there's a lot to learn, both technically and non-technically. And there's a huge demand for good software engineers. And so that's actually why my friend Alex and I, we've created the tech career growth community. So wherever you are on your software engineering journey, I would love to be able to help through videos like this or through our community. So um, I'll leave links for that in the description if you're interested. Here are three things I hope you'll take away from my experience. First, the software engineering journey takes time. In my case, it took me several years before I had the confidence that I was actually adding value to an organization. So if you're going into a three month bootcamp, for example, be clear eyed that you're not going to emerge from that three month process as an expert in a language or technology. Becoming a really good engineer takes years of practice and hard work. And that three month bootcamp might be a good starting point for your learning, but it definitely will not be an ending point for what you do. Similarly, if you come across a video called Learn Kotlin in 12 Minutes, it might give you a primer of the language, but don't expect to become an expert in Kotlin just from watching that. As you write more and more code, remember that there will be times when it's gonna be a struggle, but that struggle is where the real learning happens. One thing that's had a really positive impact in my career is not being afraid of rejection. And in fact, embracing rejection. One way to hack this is to flip your mindset and say that if you're not failing at least 50% of the time, you're probably not setting ambitious enough goals. Even within Stanford, where I felt like the majority of my classmates were smart and hardworking, I felt like many of them were really hesitant to apply for that difficult fellowship or internship because they felt like they weren't qualified or they were afraid that they might fail the interview process. I have been rejected from many, many more jobs than I actually got into especially in my first two or three years at Stanford. Rejection is part of the game. And when you acknowledge that, you won't be so afraid of it. 
Remember, no one cares how many times you failed, as long as you end up succeeding eventually. The inflection point in my learning was when I invested a lot more in applying my knowledge through teaching and building. The section leading program was amazing at Stanford because it forced me to revisit the fundamental programming concepts that I had taken for granted. I can actually trace back my passion for teaching to section leading, and that's really the reason why I have this YouTube channel. I teach at Stanford now. I have this LinkedIn learning course. Everything I can actually trace back to that. And also in my last two years at Stanford, that was when I finally started really building my own side projects. And I feel like more than any of the problem sets I did in a classroom, when I actually started building things on my own, that was really where I started learning a lot more. As much as possible, I encourage you to take what you know and do something with it. So teach it to a friend, make a video about it, or build something that applies your knowledge. If you watched this whole thing, you're a real gem. I have a lot more stuff planned, so I would love to have you join the channel or the community. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.